So we're here today to talk about passion, right? But I'm actually seeing a tension, a cultural tension, between passion and indifference. And in fact, I've been tracking the data, so much so that I'm actually calling it a mepidemic of a sweeping America right now. Now, meh entered our vocabulary in the 1990s, and it actually was entered into the Oxford Dictionary in 2015. And that was the same year that the shruggy, the whatever shruggy, the meh shruggy also, entered the, the vernacular and swept over the internet. So, you know, it got me thinking, when did all this start? So let's do a little cultural forensics together, and I'm gonna show you some data points about what's happening right now and how we got to where we are. So it starts with the concept that is called squealing. Squealing is a scientific term, it's actually from natural sciences, that actually describes a system, an ecological system, right before it collapses, you have a binary. You have two opposing viewpoints that become ever increasingly tense. So it can go this way or this way. So think about a stock market crash, right? You have increasing valence or variances between the highs and the lows, and then you have a crash. So when we have squealing, you have increasing polarity and binary systems before a critical transition or a crash. It happens when we have a seizure or a stroke. It'll happen when we have a heart attack. Climate change, it also happens with temperature variance. And it happens in culture. That's what happened with the fall of Rome. We had the schism of Rome, where we had increasing polarization. Sound familiar? Right. So, Let's talk about this because I'm a little concerned because I believe that America is squealing. And when I look back as to when this started, it seems to me that it started around the 2000s, the change of the, of the century, when we started to get all kinds of extreme behaviors, right? Extreme sports, extreme flavors, extreme home makeovers, body makeovers, extreme couponing, right? Things have gotten so hyperbolic today. We have things like extreme knitting, we have things like extreme meditation and yoga, okay, oxymoron. And we even have a competition for extreme, extreme ironing taking place. People are actually doing this on mountaintops. Anyway, so this is just to illustrate how crazy we've gotten with extremism, right? Now, when we look at our culture and we, what's going on, there's an awful lot of activism taking place, right? And some of the people have said to me, hey, Sarah, this is a time of passion. And we see that there is activism, and we see that we binge date, we binge eat, we binge drink, we binge watch. There's all this fanaticism in terms of fan culture, Game of Thrones, or sports, or festivals. And of course, there's activism. But in reality, for every one activist in Washington, it's actually, there are t hundreds of thousands of people on the sidelines who aren't doing anything, right? That's the epidemic, sitting by passively watching as all the squealing is happening in culture. So I started to talk to teachers, and I started to talk to market researchers, and you know the teachers are saying that the students, whether it's kindergarten or college, they're becoming much more incurious and dispassionate, and market researchers who I deal with are saying that consumers don't care about anything these days. So what's causing this? You know, some people posit that maybe it's all the stress that we're under and this, you know, this volatile world and the stress, so we're hunkering down. Other people say that it's maybe the opioid addiction, which is actually narrowing our field of emotional uh, spectrum, our emotional spectrum. Others say that it's abundance of choice and it's the paradox of choice and we've got so much to choose from and we're overwhelmed. Others even say it's maybe even technology, it's mitigating how we interact and it's dulling and numbing our senses. And still others say perhaps it's education that doesn't reward curiosity and passion and all those good things. So I set out to do some research to prove this point. And I wanted to see if there was really data to show this. So what I did was I looked at uh, I, using a artificial intelligence platform called Art, uh, Heartbeat AI to understand what are the true emotional intentions uh, underlying what Americans say and feel and do. And so we posed the question nationwide, 12, actually 1,200 uh, Americans, all demographics, to ask, what are you passionately curious about? to get a sense of what are they passionately curious about. And unfortunately, I'm here to share with you that the data corroborated 
them epidemic. 36% of the Americans surveyed are not passionate about anything. They're devoid of passion or curiosity. In fact, the responses were overwhelmingly mixed. Now, we looked at other data points, such as language, because language is often a mirror to what we think about and what we care about. So we look at language over the past 200 years. We've seen a huge decline in the use of words like passion and curiosity and curious. However, in the past 14 years, there's been a little bit of uptick on the, uh, the searching for the term passion. And that's interesting because we are literally searching for passion. Look at all the books on Amazon that are all about finding your passion. So what do we do about this? Because it seems like I'm a little bit of a Debbie Downer on a day celebrating passion, right? Well, I actually have a suggestion, a potential antidote. And that antidote is curiosity. And I believe that we can weaponize curiosity, actually use it in the immunization of ourselves against this epidemic. Let me show you why. I believe this is the case primarily because curiosity and passion and addiction all occupy the same parts of our brains. And they, curiosity and passion feed off of a feedback loop of dopamine and serotonin, the same neurotransmitters. So there's a direct one-to-one -one correlation between passion and curiosity. So I, this is another experiment I conducted recently in preparation for this was, across Americans, where do you feel curiosity and passion? Where in your body literally do you feel it? What's the direction of the emotion? What's the color of the emotion? So what you see behind me is the aggregate layering of all of these emotions and the responses. And it's really clear. That, the, that, that passion is felt in the gut. We're literally hungry for passion. It's warm and it radiates out of us. And curiosity, on the other hand, is in our heads. And it's cool and it's inwardly facing. But that's interesting because there's a yin yang and a simpatico and a synergy that I believe we can take advantage of because there is, in fact, a one-to-one -one correlation between passion and curiosity. When we're passionate about things, we're curious. Think about when you were in love the first time, how incredibly curious you were about that person you were passionate about. So let's weaponize curiosity, and let me show you a thought of a process to do this. We can engineer curiosity. Few people know that there are actually four styles of curiosity. We also tend to think about questions, ask questions, the essential questions, be curious. But actually, we explore the world in four ways. So clearly, we think. We're thinkers. I call them thinkers. But we've got four areas. We also have what I call pokers, which are experimenters, people who explore the world through experimentation, through hacking, through travel, by putting themselves physically into other situations to feel out the world. Then you have lookers which are exploring primarily through observation. And they're a great, keen sense of trend spotting and seeing change in the marketplace. And then you also have those, what I call lickers. <laughs> lickers explore the world sensorially. They're very, they're hypersensory. They're seeing, I'm sorry, they're tasting and touching and feeling and smelling. And they love thrills. They're thrill seekers. So you've got these four different quadrants of types of curious people. Think about it like a Myers-Briggs. Think about it like the learning style. So we all tend to lean towards one of these. And that's what's really interesting, is that at any given moment, I could profile you, and we could determine where you're leaning right now. Are you leaning toward to be a thinker today or a poker today? And what we can do is also give you exercises to stretch your curiosity horizons. So what this shows is another piece of research where we profiled 200 random Americans to, at any given moment, and it showed how people skewed and how they skewed on that particular day. But what was fascinating about it was the 16% in the center, because that sweet spot in the center are what I call the quadra curious, the people who are a mixture of all four quadrants. You might be thinking maybe you're quadra curious. Well, what's fascinating about the quadra curious is when we look at the most passionate and curious people in our culture, whether it's David Bowie or Hedy Lamarr or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Elon Musk or Da Vinci or Einstein, we see that they were actually, and they are actually, quadra curious. They explore the world through all four quadrants. So few people know that Einstein you know, is beyond being a thinker. 
He was a tinkerer. He was a DIYer and a maker on the weekends. He played with electronics. He was very sexual and sensual. And he had an extremely keen sense of aesthetic and design to show that he was a looker. He was a looker, a licker, a poker, and a thinker. <laughs> and that, I believe, is a key to passion. Now, he lived probably, what, 30 miles from here doing research. My point is, is that he probably came to Asbury Park exercising his curiosity muscles. He probably came here innately, right? And he knew, he knew, he knew that his success in life was not his intellect, meaning his IQ. It was his passion and curiosity combined. That was what unlocked him. This is where it gets interesting for us to have a social experiment. I have two social experiments for us today. The first is I would like to propose a new office of government. The office of the curious. Now, you might say, oh, that's kind of ridiculous, right? Taxpayer money. But look, in Sweden, we have the office of the future. In the UK, actually has a government office of loneliness. The UAE has a government office of, of, of happiness. And New York City has a government office of nightlife. So why not an office of the curious? So in this government office would look after the municipal health of a, of a, of a town, of a municipality. They would measure curiosity, and they would actually instigate programs and interventions to make sure that the healthfulness and the curiousness of a, of a town will thrive. And we know, we know from science, it's proven that when you're more curious, you live longer. You're more resilient to change, like squealing. You're more collaborative. You're more entrepreneurial. You're more innovative. And so there are lots of benefits to being more curious. Now, this is where Asbury Park gets into the picture. I believe Asbury Park is a natural magnet for curiousness. Asbury Park caters to the lickers and the lookers and the pokers and the thinkers. You can go walking tours and see art. You can have food and music. There's great history here. It's a natural place for the first office of the curious in the United States. So I've created a change.org petition to put it on the ballot in November. And then you can, in fact, you can go, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. You can go to a website I created for this occasion, which is called 10xcurious.com. And on it is, in fact, the petition for the office of the curious. But this is the second social experiment. I've created a walking tour of Asbury Park designed specifically to stretch curiosity muscles. So on the tour, we will profile you, give you a sense of where you're leaning right now, and then give you some opportunity to stretch your curiosity horizons on the tour. And we'll measure the difference, and we're going to measure the passion, the ergo, the passion, the difference of passion too. So you can, all, you can sign up for the tour. It'll be given three times this summer for free, just for fun. It's part of an experiment. So in conclusion, we're going about our day-to-day -day exploring passion, but I'm going to really suggest you to think, are you exploring passionately as a looker, as a licker, as a poker, or a thinker? Please stretch yourself to do all four. We know that when you unlock curiosity, life becomes a lot more meaningful, a lot more colorful, and a lot more passionful. Thank you very much.